Welcome to another Brown Bag Lecture Series here at the Museum of Nebraska History. Filming of the lectures is paid for by the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation. Our speaker today is Rob Bozell, who is the Associate Director of Archaeology for the Nebraska State Historical Society. His topic is Engineer Contonement, the 1819-1820 Winter Quarters of the Long Expedition from Pittsburgh to the Rocky Mountains. So now it is my pleasure to present to you Rob Bozell. Don't clap yet. You haven't heard anything. It could be really bad. Uh, thanks, John. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, talk to you about a project that we've been working on for a couple of years that we're really excited about. In fact, I've been working on this, working here for about 20 years, and this is the project that I think I've had the most fun at. And I want to, first off the bat, give credit to a couple other people that have worked with me on this. I've had a lot of people work with me, but in particular, Gail Carlson uh, out of our office, who's an archaeologist at the Historical Society, and also uh, Robert Pepperall, who's an independent uh, archaeologist out of Lincoln. We've, the three of us have worked on this for the last couple of years, and uh, those guys deserve as, as much, if not more, credit than I do. Uh, I want to talk to you about the site, uh, why we were looking for it, why we had to find it, why, how we did find it, and what we've done so far, and what our plans are in the, in the future. And as uh, John said, I'll probably talk for blither for 30 or 40 minutes, uh, and then I'll have time for some questions, which um, I I'd, I'd invite as many of you to ask as many questions as you got. Um, except I see there's archaeologists in the park service. You guys can't ask questions. You, you, guys, you, didn't, you didn't tell me these guys were coming. Okay. Um, the, uh, the long expedition was in 1819, 1820, and it was part of a larger um, military and scientific expedition uh, up the Missouri River. And, and part of it resulted in the, in the construction of Fort Atkinson in 1821. This was a smaller component of it under the command of uh, Major Stephen Long. And what, it was a very small group, we don't know the exact number, maybe 15 or 20 people that were charged with um, they were mostly scientists and topogra topographical engineers. They were botanists, artists, naturalists, um, mapping people, and they were supposed to uh, do some mapping of the plains and the rivers, uh, document the flora and fauna, and cement relations with some of the Indian tribes. Um, and, and so they, they, what they originally intended to do was go up the Missouri River, and they got to north of Omaha in, in this fall of 1819 and wintered over there. Wintered there for about eight or nine months. They built a couple log cabins, stayed there, and then they got orders over the winter not to proceed up the Missouri but to go out and explore the Platte River. And so they went out the Platte all the way to the Rocky Mountains. If any of you have been to Rocky Mountain um, National Park, uh, Long's Peak is named after Stephen Long. Uh, the commander of this, although I don't think he ever went up there. He sent somebody else up there, but then named it for himself. Um, so one of the luxuries of uh, being an officer. He, um, he was also the person who I think, and I'm not sure about this, coined the term the Great American Desert as he went through Nebraska. And, and once they got out to the Rocky Mountains, they then headed south and uh, ended up going through the southern plains back to the east coast. Um, all these guys, it was a, it was a combination of uh, military personnel and civilian scientists and engineers. Uh, all from the East Coast, a lot of them from aristocratic East Coast families, and I'm going to talk to you about a couple of these guys, one in particular who was real critical in allowing us to, to find this place. Um, we've been tracking down a couple of portraits of some of these individuals. Thomas Say was a, uh, was a naturalist who went on to become a very important, for any of you who are into snail shells and mussel shells, he is like the godfather of snails and mussels. Most of you probably never heard of him, but uh, snail people just, you know, this guy is, is God. Um, and uh, Edwin James is another one who was a naturalist. Uh, but this guy in particular, Titian Ramsey Peel, his father was Charles Wilson Peel, who many of you have seen his work. He was a, a portrait artist in the East Coast, was friends, and, and did a lot of portraits of Washington and Jefferson and, and some of the, the uh, founding fathers of, of the country. And through his influence, he got his young son, Titian, who was 19 years old, on this expedition as, the, as one of the two expedition artists. Another one was a guy named Samuel Seymour. Um, we've, uh, the, we have a contract with the Nebraska Department of Roads, uh, the Archaeology Division of the Historical Society, that's required under federal law for us to look at all their federally funded construction projects and identify important historic and, and archaeological sites, and then if they're going to be Im Im negatively impacted by construction, we either work with them to avoid the site or to do some excavation prior to construction. We do work this statewide. And, this uh, site, Engineer Cantonment, 
was suspected to be along a proposed county road, federally funded county road project. So there was some urgency in trying to find, we knew roughly where it was within a couple miles stretch along the Missouri River Bluffs, but not precisely at all. Uh, Department of Roads is always very, very cooperative, uh, except they do get kind of crabby when, when they find stuff when, during construction, they like to have us, you know, get it done before construction. So we wanted to try to find it. And, and there were some accounts of it was a certain distance from certain places, from the river and that kind of stuff, but that's really difficult because the rivers move so many times that it's hard to say, well, and it's X number of miles from a certain point in 1820 when the river may be three or four miles away now. Um, there's some, there was a series of maps, this is one produced by Fremont and Nicolet uh, later on uh, that does show it, I've um, got a little pointer here, it shows that after it was abandoned and some other sites, right there it says Engineer Cantonment. There's Manuel Lisa's trading post, which we found is about a half a mile south. We haven't found it. We think we know about where it is. Uh, this wasn't much help because the river is really in a very different, different place now. Um, so Titian Peel, among the many paintings that he made when he was not there for his eight or nine months, um, wandered out onto the floodplain and painted their, their encampment. And here's the bluffs you can see, and there's a uh, building there. We think there's actually two buildings. I've got a close-up of it which shows this, what we think is the second building. Uh, this is what they call the harbor. It's probably not the main channel of the river. It's like an oxbow that was open on one end where they, was, they would uh, uh, dock the boats. This is the Western Engineer, which I believe was the first um, steamboat to ascend the Missouri River this far. Um, and they had several other boats they came up on. So young Peel went out there and, and made this painting. Uh, he actually made it probably an ink sketch originally, and then when he got back to Philadelphia, he made several versions of this painting. One has the boat in it, one has a deer in front of it, but it's all the same background. So we tried to use this uh, painting as a way to try to find this thing. Again, we knew within about a two or three mile stretch. And this site, by the way, is north of Omaha. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Omaha, north of the Mormon Bridge, about five miles up there by Hummel Park, N.P. Dodge Park, that area, that, that what they call a river road or North River Road. Um, so we, Gail and Bob and I, um, decided to kind of drive up and down this road, which actually runs right along the base of the bluff that they're going to do the construction in, and, and try to find topography that matched this. And nothing really looked very good, uh, particularly in the summer when it's all overgrown. So we went out two winters ago and actually moved off the, off the bluff edge and out onto the floodplain where Peel would have been roughly where he had painted this. We thought maybe a quarter eighth of a mile. And did finally find, here's a close up of that by the way, same painting you can see one big building here and then a little shadow of something behind it. We think that, it, that there's two buildings. And in these guys in their journals, they talk about when we got here, we, we, we uh, uh, quarried limestone and cut wood and built our cabins or quarters or huts. And they always have it plural. So we're pretty sure there's a couple of buildings that they were living in. Anyway, that's a close-up of the same one. Um, so we did finally find a place that, that really kind of matched that, that had that real distinctive ravine and then kind of this hollow back here. This little red block I've got there, I just put in with the computer, is about where those cabins would have been if, if this was the place. And here's the two pictures side by side. And it's pretty remarkably similar. There's no place along that two or three mile stretch where you had that really uh, pronounced ravine like that with this bowl back here, just like that. That's, that area is probably that. That ravine, we think, is, is this ravine. You can see it's a lot wider now, but that's probably just a product of 180 years of erosion, just widening out and the soil coming down through slope wash uh, erosion and rainwater and that kind of thing. So we had a real good target uh, because, as I said, nothing else really looked very good other than that place. So we brought to bear a couple of techniques to try to find this thing. And, and uh, the first thing we did was uh, hire a, a contractor who lays uh, fiber optic cables to put a trench right along the base of that bluff um, uh, and then see what was coming up. And what we did was examine it. And this trench is very narrow. It's only about six inches wide, and it, but it goes down about eight feet. So even though it, if we hit the site, it would take a slice out of it, it, it would, the, the damage it might do to it was very, very minimal, and it would be, be a good way to find it. So we tried to do this, and, and right at the bottom of that ravine, and really only at the bottom of that ravine, uh, in the back dirt of this cable trench, we started finding uh, burned limestone, some animal bone, I think a couple of uh, musket balls, and some other artifacts that looked about that time period, early, early 19th century. Um, did a couple other things, hired uh, 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 Bob Nickel and his wife Kay, who, who are uh, independent consultants and do remote sensing like ground penetrating radar and magnetometer. Had them come out and use some of their equipment to try to do it. And there's 
Bob and Kay, uh, Bob, Kay's doing all the work and Bob's walking behind her mumbling and taking notes. Um, so they, they tried a couple things. Ground penetrating radar, which is what this machine is. It looks like a lawnmower and the, and the actual radar is, uh, is this little box down here on the cart and they just push it along. Uh, we, I think we were doing it at either one meter, half meter intervals over a big square area and it collects data as, it, as you push it along and then Bob can create maps. Uh, showing what he's seeing under the ground in terms of resistance of walls or burned areas or that kind of thing. Um, the first, he just did a small area over right where we're finding the most material in that, in that little uh, trench, that cable trench, and, and see this kind of uh, dark rectangle? This is, you kind of got to use your imagination. If you guys see that from there, that showed up over where we were finding things. And it's not, it's, it's far too small to be a building, but it's about the right size of, of what we now know is the, excuse me, the fireplace. Uh, whether it is or not, I'm not sure, but it was certainly an anomaly. And Bob's uh, machine can also tell you roughly about what depth that, he's, that these things are showing up. And it was at about the depth where we could see some of this limestone coming out of the, out of the wall of this cable trench. Um, we also had Bob do a, uh, a magnetometer survey, which is a glorified, very glorified, $30,000 glorified uh, metal detector, um, which is a different technique. It looks for different things, but the result is, the, is sort of the same, looking for things under the ground without digging. Uh, a lot of noise here. This is, an, this is a, a farmyard. It's never been cultivated, but it was somebody's farmyard since we think probably the 1870s on up through just 15 years ago. Uh, so, a lot of these little, little blips and stuff are just recent trash, cans, beer cans in the road. Not, not our beer cans, but other people's beer cans. Um, uh, this is the road out, out here, actually, because uh, it picks up any metal. So, but the one thing we did kind of see, and also right in about the area we were seeing stuff on the radar, was this sort of open-ended rectangle. There's a, potentially a wall there, wall here, and a wall going there, maybe up here. It kind of opened on this end. So that did correspond with where we were finding things in the, in the, in the cable trench, and it corresponded with this, that, that one small rectangle in the radar ends up about in almost square in the middle of that thing. So it looked like this very well could be one of those buildings. Um, and uh, still, at this point, this is last year, had not found the second building. I think we may have it now, but it's, it's a little iffy. What we think now is that, is that it's probably up here. This may be a wall of that second building. We're not sure yet. Um, this is just kind of a plan of this dark, dark uh, rectangle here is, is just drawn in about where Bob's magnetometer anomaly was, that rectangle there. And then here's some of our excavations as of last year. We actually expanded this up to here. So we started kind of working in the middle of that to see if we could confirm if this was a, indeed a building and if it was of that same time period, early 1900s, and if it is indeed engineer cantonment. Um, we've had a uh, cooperative agreement with the University of Nebraska off and on for the last 10 years to uh, to help teach their, their uh, field school. Uh, they have an archaeological field school. We take them for three weeks, uh, last four or five years. We brought them out there last year and this year. Um, and uh, and here's that, this is this year's field school, and that was last year's. Uh, they get college credit for it, and they'll do anything for an A, including lay down in the mud if I tell them to. Um, it's a good deal. You know, they, they get good experience. Uh, we get free or cheap labor, and, uh, and they get correct for it. So it's, and this is a, it was a really nice site, I think, to, to train people on some field methods. Um, here's a few pictures of the excavations. This is actually just a couple of weeks ago in this field school. This is a, uh, what turns out to be a platter that was down on the floor of, of, of one of these cabins. In fact, I, and I didn't see this, but somebody said there was actually a turkey bone on the platter. I'm not sure if that was true or not, but maybe it's somebody's Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and uh, here's just a picture of from taken on top of that bluff, looking down onto the excavation. That's the road out there that they're widening now. Here's our middle of our excavation of that one building. Uh, everything we dig, we dig in one meter square, so we kind of know where everything is within the building. And that way later, if we want to reconstruct where sleeping areas were, where workshop areas were, or cooking areas, we can try to reconstruct all that. Um, some of the features that we found um, that I want to kind of show you some pictures of is uh, several of these roasting pits, uh, this is hard to see, but it's a big kind of a U-shaped thing that was filled with charcoal and burned earth. Um, this may or may not be a specific feature that one of the, the uh, residents referred to in their journal. They talked about some Native Americans coming down and having a feast. They cooked uh, the hump meat off a of bison, and they, he has this description about them wrapping it in, in rawhide and digging a pit 
sort of like that shape and putting this thing in there and sort of roasting this thing and then having a feast and a dance and that kind of stuff. But it, it's, in a, it's right outside the door of, or the wall of one of these things that we found in a backhoe trench. So it could be that particular feature that he was talking about or a similar one. There is a lot, seems to be a lot of little fireplaces outside the building that we found subsequently. Um, on the floor of this one cabin we were working at, a few other features. This is a little pit about, about that big that was just filled with corn cobs, uh, charred corn cobs. And we think it may be what's called a smudge pit. Corn cobs create a real smoky fire and there was a couple things they may have wanted to do that. One, sometimes they would use it to, as a fumigant if you had problem with bed bugs or stuff to you know, kind of fumigate the place. Also, these guys were, one of the things that they were doing was collecting uh, mammals and, and birds particularly, I think also some reptiles and amphibians and, and giving them the Latin taxonomic names and even collecting specimens and doing some field taxidermy and preparing these uh, skins and taking them back to Philadelphia. And so it could relate to that because um, on also next to this pit we found uh, pairs of uh, post holes uh, where a post had been in the ground. Post is no longer there but it, the wood rots and it leaves kind of a stain. And they seem to be sort of near this corn cob filled pit. So it could be, and Peel has a painting of some birds and stuff where they're hanging from something like rafters on the ceiling. So it may have somehow relate to preparing these, uh, the taxidermy, preparing these skins that, that they took back. Ironically, the collection of these mammals and birds that they that went back to um, Philadelphia with them and went to the Peel Museum, which is now the American Philosophical Society. I'm not quite sure about the details, but I think they were having some financial problems and sold that whole collection of the Barnum and Bailey Circus and then it's gone. I mean there was a fire and we can't we can't find it. But we are finding some bones, animal bones and bird bones um, of some of the species that these guys were collecting. Whether they're from those actual specimens or not, we may never know. But we are finding animal bones that don't appear to be dietary things like sandhill cranes and herons and that kind of stuff. Um, in and around the floor of this cabin we're finding little small fireplaces which again they may be little they just expressed as patches of a lot of ash and charcoal and burned earth, or they could be um, just where they're cleaning out the main fireplace, which I'll show you in a minute, massive fireplace, and just dumping the ashes out. We're not quite sure what they are, but there we got several of these things. This is uh, what we think is the main fireplace, and it, and it kind of corresponds in some way with that original small rectangular anomaly that Bob picked up on his ground penetrating radar. Um, and this is partially excavated here. Uh, we did more of it this summer, and this is right in the middle of that, that big rectangular anomaly, um, which we think is the building. It's in, and we were finding some evidence of walls last year, what we think are walls, and this centers pretty well. And, and what we think that these buildings were, they were long, rectangular, 40-some feet by 20-some feet. We don't know the exact dimensions. It had a big fireplace in the middle, and, and it probably had one chimney but two openings, and there was an interior wall to create two rooms. So it's like a duplex, there was two rooms. And, and in fact the painting shows two front doors, two sets of front windows, and then it probably had this wall. You can see the chimney. So, so what we're kind of looking at here is this, these four squares in the middle are probably the middle of the fireplace, um, which were not excavated in this picture, but we have subsequently done it. And that this rectangular thing may actually be the fireplace. The chimney would have come up here, there'd be an opening for, the, for one room over here, and then this would be the opening for the, what turns out to be the southern room on this side. Uh, and it's kind of like a food hearth, food preparation area. And we have some plans from similar military um, uh, forts and, and uh, cantonments that, that show these fireplaces like this with these little wings coming out, uh, just kind of to create a little food preparation area. I think that's what these wings are. Um, we excavated more of it this summer and found out that it's just a mass of limestone. It's just, there's some of the uh, UNL field school kids from a few weeks ago working in there. And see that kind of orange tinge? That's from really, when, burn, when dirt gets burned really hot, it turns orange. And um, so it turns out the middle of it's just a rubble of, uh, uh, just a pile of, of limestone rubble. So we still think it is, but it looks like the chimney, but probably wasn't a limestone chimney. It was probably a wooden chimney that was lined with clay to keep it from catching on fire, but it had a big, limestone fireplace has just kind of collapsed down on it. So it's pretty meticulous digging things out of here. But that's where a lot of the, the artifacts have been is in and around this fireplace. Stuff that was broken and they were tossing in the fireplace. Food remains, that kind of thing. Um, this is actually a, a, something that we noticed when we were excavating on the edge of the fireplace, this real distinct dark line. And again, this may relate to what Bob was seeing on his radar. I'm not sure what it is yet. It may be the edge of the 
fireplace, may, maybe another interior wall, don't know, but, but we'll, we'll get that all sorted out eventually. Um, we, dug, uh, we hired a geomorphologist who's a, a person who studies soils and can try to, um, through study of soils, be able to, to kind of sort out the, um, the landscape evolution, how old the site was, what, what it was like when they lived there, what may be going on, older, deeper, that kind of thing. So we dug a series of three or four backhoe trenches out here over the last couple of years. This is one of them. And one of the, this is one where, Jer where uh, Jeremy Dillon, our geomorphologist from, from the University of Nebraska at Kearney, um, was out there. And we were interested to see, this is actually looking from our excavations out onto the floodplain, if he could find that channel that's shown in the Peel painting, uh, that, where the boats are parked. And he thinks he has found it. Very, right at the end of it and going under the road, that's the road out there, he can see from the soil a big U-shaped profile, which has got a lot of sand and silt and stuff in it, which looks very consistent with what he would say it was an old channel. So I think we know exactly where that channel is, where the boats are, were parked. Um, and, and it's got to be pretty close, I don't know if you noticed on the painting, to, um, the, to the cabins, because one of those, those, that front cabin, you can see the reflection of it on the water. Uh, so this is really useful information to see if we know where that channel is in relation to our excavation, see if it would have been able to cast that reflection onto the water. Um, also, in the course of digging some of these backhoe trenches, that's one of my cohorts, Gail Carlson, down there, um, uh, we found deeply buried, about two or three meters deep, some early uh, Native American occupation there, too, which, which Jeremy thinks, again, we don't have radiocarbon dates yet, but he thinks it's probably about somewhere between three and 4,000 years old. Uh, this big ashy area down here is, is, turns out to be a big uh, Native American fireplace of that period, three or 4,000 years ago. That's after it's excavated. So that's another kind of added benefit to this site. It's not just a single occupation. There appears to be some stratified uh, Native American stuff underneath the cantonment level. Um, some of the artifacts that have come out, uh, some, some pretty fancy stuff. These guys are not out there with tin cups and plates. They're, you know, I said a lot of them are East Coast aristocrats. They're bringing some of the fancy stuff. A lot of pipes, and uh, the style of the pipes is, is uh, <clears throat> and Gail's a real expert on this material culture, um, is, is very consistent with that early 1800s period. Uh, a lot of them have this mark TD on them, which is real common of that period. Um, but a lot of them are pretty fancy, a lot of some floral designs, some linear designs. We've got, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 pipe bowls and, and probably dozens and dozens of pipe stem fragments. These are the long stem, you know, kind of colonial era, era pipes. Um, fair amount of uh, Native American artifacts, which are probably trade goods. As I mentioned earlier, one of the missions that these guys had was to, uh, and also the other, the military people at Fort Atkinson, or that established Fort Atkinson, was to kind of firm up relations with some of the local tribes, the Omaha, Odo, um, Iowa, uh, Ponca, Pawnee, and so there was a couple of major meetings, councils they had with a couple of tribes. I'll show you some paintings here in a minute, and there was just a lot of visiting, uh, and you know, between some of these tribes. So we've got some artifacts which are probably related to that, like this Calanite uh, uh, pipe bowl, which is Native American. We've got a couple of uh, iron arrowheads, uh, which are very typical of that period. Again, this is by this time. Most of the Native American culture were not making stone tools and ceramic pots anymore. They had European goods that they were making. Um, so it's the, what we're finding is pretty consistent with that. Um, quite a bit of ceramics, and again, it's all, you know, once we get down to that floor level of that cabin, it's very consistent with, you know, late 1700s, early 1800s ware, these blue transfer ware, pearl ware, cream ware, some of this, which is actually called mocha ware, which we've got, I think we have more of this now, and almost a complete bowl of it, um, you know, about the size of like a salad bowl. Um, Buttons, uh, it's just kind of almost what you'd expect, a combination of some civilian, you know, unmarked civilian uh, buttons and also military buttons. These three, which you probably can't see real well, but you can see this middle one, has kind of a script cursive A on it. Those also do, and then underneath it they have a number, one, two, three. What that stands for, again, according to Gail, and he's, he knows the buttons, is uh, artillery, and then the number is the regiment, first, second, third regiment of the artillery. Um, one that just says U.S., and then these may be civilian buttons. There's a bone button, we have some shell buttons, and just plain metal buttons. But it's pretty consistent with what you expect with a, a uh, part military and part civilian uh, expedition. Uh, quite a few lead balls from, from uh, various, uh, you know, guns, flintlock guns, um, and uh, some just chunks of lead, which are probably raw material maybe for making some of these balls. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Patriot where he's melting down little soldiers in the thing. You know, it's um, probably that kind of thing. Quite a few uh, gun flints, both French and English gun flints, we're finding those. I don't know how many we have, but probably a couple dozen so far. And again, it's very, very typical of, you know, before they had, you know, rifles. Um, 
uh, all the nails are square nails. They're done, they're, there's a fair amount of nails, but there's not nearly enough nails to, to suggest that they had a wooden floor in there. You, you get a lot more flooring nails. So they probably just had a dirt floor um, because we're not finding tons of nails all over the floor. When, when Gales worked at Fort Atkinson, where they did have floorboards, he's finding quite a bit of nails up there where we don't find that here. But, but the nails are all uh, you know, hand-wrought square nails. Uh, this is kind of a neat thing. It's a, it's a plumb bob. Um, Gail was going on vacation last year and was kept grousing about how he'd really like to find something that would prove there was engineers here. And the day he left, one of the uh, hi junior high school kids we had out there came up with that little, that big ugly thing up there in the corner and asked what it was. And it's lead, very heavy, and it's the shape of a plumb bob. And it probably was from one of the engineers. Because they were actually establishing um, mapping stations on that bluff right above here and mapping the river. So it's, it very well probably relates to that. Uh, here's a piece of a fork. Uh, we do had actually a couple weeks ago found a nice big spoon too, uh, which I don't have a picture of. Some of the knives, um, this is a pocket knife, which amazingly looks very much like pocket knives today. I mean, it looks like a Boy Scout knife. It really hasn't, you know, I think they got a good idea how to make one of those and they haven't really changed very much. And then more sort of hunting knives and, and table knives. This one's still got the wood or bone, we're not sure, preserved on it. I think that also has maybe has some bone or wood adhering to it. A lot of this, uh, these items are now in Omaha at the Ford Conservation Center where Julie Riley, our, conserv our conservator, is uh, treating those, stabilizing them, stop the rust, that kind of thing. And, and she's also doing things like X-raying them where she can look and see how much of the metal is left so she can uh, kind of chart a course for stabilization on these things. A um, few other pieces of kind of unidentified iron that we haven't sorted out yet. Uh, very few coins. I think we've got one or two coins. They're both Spanish. This is a one real. Again, these guys probably didn't have any reason for currency. And the fact that this one, and maybe the other one, also has a hole drilled in it, kind of makes us think that it may not even have been one of the expedition members, but a Native American trade good. You know, that was another thing. They would you know, take coins and perforate them and use them as uh, decorative items. Um, this is something that was kind of neat. In that one roasting pit I showed you earlier on, found some little tiny pieces of what looked like felt or plastic and in, in when we were processing and cleaning the soil and thought it may be some recent contaminant off somebody's clothes or farm set stuff, but we showed it to Julie Riley in Omaha, who's got a lot of experience with material culture from the East Coast in the colonial period, and she knew right away what it was from the type of material or the weave or something, I'm not sure that it was this kind of linen that was used to wrap uh, cone sugar for expeditions at about this time period. They had these kind of cones of sugar and they would wrap this stuff in it and that may even be chunks of sugar ad adhering to it, but that's little pieces of that. So there is fabric preserved there, and you don't usually get fabric preserved in eastern Nebraska this, uh, at this time. It doesn't preserve very well. So it's, the preservation of the site is very good, very, very well preserved. Um, the other thing about that, that, that roasting pit that this came out of, we had a woman in Canada who I, who's an archaeologist but also is either a chemist or has a lot of experience in chemistry and she's had some success at taking soil out of features like this and extract protein lipids and can tell what kind of animal was cooked in there and we've got the results back from her and and it's not conclusive but she said it's con the, the, she is getting preserved lipids in there and, and found that it is uh, consistent with a mixture of corn and, and some kind of large ungulate meat like bison or elk or something like that so it's kind of consistent with potentially being that specific pit. Um, some of the animal bone um, is clearly food, food remains. One thing that seems to be more, more large mammal than anything else is elk. There are a lot of elk, believe it or not, a lot of elk around here at that time. Uh, see some of these paintings by Bodmer and Catlin, they're, they're, they, they say there's elk up in here. We're also getting antelope bone too, so we've got species that aren't, no longer occur in eastern Nebraska. Some of it's food remains, but there's also things that, that may relate to these, this collecting, the, the, the uh, taxonomy they were doing. Like I said, there were sandhill cranes and herons and some other animals that wouldn't normally be expected to be hunted. Because there are a lot of turkeys around there. I mean, you get a lot of turkey bone too. So it could be that some of these bones are related, as I said, to that. Here's some of the corn cobs that came out of, uh, came out of that one's pit. And, and um, what we're going to do in terms of, of further study on, to get this kind of stuff is we're taking samples of soil from throughout the floor of this, uh, these cabins, we, find it, we screen it through a really, really super fine screen and it, we can recover small seeds, maybe pollen, very small animal bones, that kind of thing. So we'll be able to sort out more about the diet, climate, and, and you know, what they were eating and what they were, potentially what they were collecting too. And again, we did, we've got several hundred bags of dirt over there across the street. If anybody's looking for something to do for some volunteer work, give me a call because we've got, got a lot to do. All right. Um, 
Okay, some of the paintings uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, the, these, this is by the Samuel Seymour, the other artist, not Peel. Uh, this is the Odo Council that, was, that they had there. Again, I don't know where it is, whether that may be that ravine. It's kind of hard to say. Thought maybe this may be one of those buildings, but I think it's a tent. They had some tents set up there. Um, so this took place here at that place. These are, this is probably later on after the camp, uh, Camp Helmut, Missouri was established, which ultimately resulted in Fort Atkins. And that's why you got a lot of these military officers coming down from there, which was about five miles north of Engineer Cantonment, for these councils with the Indians. There's a Pawnee Council, again, looking out. That's that, that harbor out there. Uh, again, our county road probably comes right through here. Um, and uh, it was kind of, last summer we had a woman named Alice Alexander, who's the Pawnee tribal historian, out for a couple of weeks with her son working with us. And she came out and worked here, and I've shown her this painting. And, you know, and I said, you're probably the first Pawnee to walk out here, you know, and since, since 1820s. And, and uh, she really recognized the significance of it too, and they're, they're real interested in this from their role in it, you know, in, in, the, in terms of the Native American perspective on this. Uh, this is another Peel painting that we found. Um, this is a, a, a sketch of some Odo's, again, probably camping there on visits, you know, at this council or other council when they were there. Uh, what he really did was a lot of wildlife paintings, but he did do some, uh, he, once they left here, uh, engineer Canton, but they went out and stayed with the Pawnee for a brief time, a few days, maybe a week or two, I'm not sure, at one of the Pawnee villages, and went on some bison hunts with them. I think that's probably where he made this, this again, painting or sketch. I think most of these he made field sketches and then did watercolors once he got back to Philadelphia. Uh, this was uh, also probably when they were staying with the Pawnee after they left, a few weeks after they left Engineer Canton. But that's a can't see it here, but a cluster of earth lodges out there. So he's depicting an earth lodge village, probably on the Platte River somewhere. This appears to be probably a collapsed, burned earth lodge, and some uh, guys sitting there, probably you know, looking for game or whatever. But uh, so there's some, and I, I don't know what there's a there's a little caption there, which I need to find out what that says, because uh, it may say specifically where they were. We can figure out what Pawnee village that was, which would be real interesting to know. Um, one of the animals that uh, I was out there bailing water out last year and this little garter snake kept coming up and bugging me and I thought I'd take a picture of him because I had a couple of shots left in the, in the camera and it's kind of, the garter snake was one of the many animals. I think there's 140 species of plants of animals that these guys identified from right at that locality, including the garter snake. And uh, this was kind of neat because it um, took this picture of this little guy and then looked at him and couldn't figure out what his head looked real funny and he's all got this big head and I looked up closer and he had a frog in his mouth and see that's a, that's like the frog's rear, rear end there and his legs sticking out and and uh, look back at the frog later or at the snake and the frog was gone I thought, oh, that's great that little frog got away from that snake and, but then I looked down here sort of mid thorax and there's a big <laughs> frog shaped bulge and uh, anyway, he got him but uh, anyway this could be sort of the, one of the Adam uh, the descendants of the Adam and Eve garter snake that these guys first identified it engineer Cantoma. Um, another peel painting it's a nice lunch painting of a wolf devouring an elk or deer uh, crane, this is again probably right out there, that may be that bend in the river, that harbor, because um, this was painted there. And this is one of the ones I was talking about where it's a hawk, I think it's actually a falcon, I'm not sure. Any birders in here, if you've got any ideas, feel free to tell me. But it does say Engineer Cantonment, February 1820, but see he's got that hanging on a peg or a rafter or something there. So it may be one of the ones that they were, they were processing. Um, okay, uh, what kind of, I don't really have a whole lot of pictures from the last few weeks, but I did want to say that that I think we may have a, a better handle on this second building. Uh, we were all along thinking that the, the main building we've been working in where I showed all these pictures was that, was that front building, the one that's, that's real prominent in the Peel painting, and that the other building is behind it. We did some test excavations with the University uh, Field School and couldn't find anything behind it, anything conclusive. There was a little artifacts, it was all later, 1860s, 70s, 80s stuff, nothing conclusive. And then on the last couple of days, um, we decided to do some work out in front of the main building. And there we are starting to find some artifacts of that same time period and some clusters of limestone. So it could be that that building is out front. We'll have to, we'll have to see, do some more work there. Uh, we're done working there for now because it's too hot and I can't stand being out in the hot eastern Nebraska weather. So we just quit. Um, but we are going to do some more work there in, in the fall. It, um, uh, so kind of to wrap up and then we'll have some time for, for some questions, uh, some of the significance that we see of this site. It's, it's really, it's more than just archaeology. It's, it's a lot more than just archaeology. It's got this connection with this very, very important scientific expedition. Now, a lot of people hadn't, I mean, Lewis and Clark has kind of overshadowed all this stuff, and rightfully so, maybe. Um, but 
But I think it's a, a whole different perspective on exploring the American West. And, and this was a true scientific expedition. Um, and they collected a lot of data. And I've gotten a lot of contacts from Hugh Genoways and some other people that are, you know, botanists and mammologists and, and people like that that are real excited about that have heard about this place for a long time because there was so much scientific work done there. They're real excited that we're doing an archaeology project there. So it's not just archaeology. It's relation with some of the Indian tribes. Uh, I think we're going to get a better handle on early early 1800s architecture and subsistence, you know, what these guys were eating and what and why, how they were preparing their food, the material culture. And once we got all this sorted out, again, there were some, some of the, we know names of some of these, these prominent officers and gentlemen, but a lot of them the enlisted men and the boat men, we don't even know who these guys were. And because we're, you know, excavating everything in specific squares, we know where everything will come from, we, we'll be able to, to look at, probably sort out where the enlisted men were living versus the officers based on the type of, you know, food, based on the type of, uh, you know, the fanciness of the ceramics and that kind of stuff. So um, we got, there's a lot of potential there. We don't have any intention of excavating the whole thing. We're just going to continue to kind of do a little sampling to sort of get a better handle on this site. And, and because it's so well preserved, as I said, it's never been cultivated and it's buried about that deep. And the reason it's buried is it's right at the base of that bluff, which is kind of a good thing because you've had this slope wash that's come down and just sealed this thing. And other than the farmyard being there, a little bit of gardening and some, some shacks and stuff, or chicken coop maybe and some fencing, there really hasn't been any damage to it. And because it was um, so well preserved and had such a close association with important historic events, not just straight archaeology, we approached, or I wanted to approach the landowners about potentially raising money to purchase it and get it into state ownership and maybe d develop it as a historic site somewhere down the road. So I called these folks, they're re farmers, retired, live in Omaha, and uh, Mrs. Gibriel stopped me in mid-sentence and said, no, we're not going to sell it to you because we've already decided to donate it to you, which is a, which is a great thing. So they're going to donate, we're negotiating with them. Probably three or four acres will be that whole bottom land where the uh, the site is, and then that also part of that ravine, which is a very important topographic figure to this whole story. So we're going to have that, and, and uh, it'll be donated to this historical society. Be used off and on for you know to do research there. Again, it's such a nice site. We're not going to excavate the whole thing. We're just going to, like I said, do some sampling of it. Maybe in the long term, down the road, uh, develop into a historic site. Don't quote me on that, as I say this on TV. Um, uh, <laughs> Duh. Um, anyway, so, so that's kind of the story now. We, we haven't had a chance to look at a lot of the artifacts. I said we got a couple hundred bags of dirt in the basement over there. We'll know a lot more in a year. Uh, we got a grant from the Department of Roads and the Federal Highway Administration to hire a couple people um, to work on it. So we'll probably be producing a report, maybe a small book within a year, year and a half, and uh, we'll know a lot more about what these people are doing here. Um, now's the time when I can, you can ask questions and I can make up whatever I want to make up because there's nobody there that in the 1820s to tell me I'm not telling the truth. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wonder how, uh, how did you uh, avail yourself of those paintings and drawings? Uh, there, um, Laura, Laura's here? Okay. Do you want to come up here and maybe answer? We, 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 the, we don't, they're, they're prints that we got, but we're going to be having a history conference in October in Omaha that's going to focus on this and, and, and Laura Mooney in our collection division, didn't think you'd get into this did you, mm -hmm. is working to try to uh, get loans on some of those. So I don't know, you know a little bit more about some of those places where they're at. Yeah. A number of the Peel drawings and paintings are at the State Historical Society of Iowa and so we should be getting quite a few of those for the small exhibit we'll be doing in October and then um, there Many of them are actually at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, um, and hopefully we'll be getting a few of those as well. Um, many of the Samuel Seymour paintings are at Yale. Um, we won't be having any of those included in our exhibit this time around. Um, so they're a bit scattered about, but hopefully we'll get quite a few here for the fall, and you'll be able to see some of them. You know, they'll be on display in Omaha, maybe Lincoln, we're not sure, but yeah. So this really was a well-known uh, project. It was a well-known expedition. Yeah. Uh, what was not well-known was where this place was. Yeah, yeah. So people have known about it for a long time. Yes, sir. Are there Thanks, other Lord. campsites across, along the plot, across Nebraska? Related to this expedition? Yes, there certainly are many. Whether we'd ever find them or not is, you know. can't, couldn't find them, yeah. 
um, again, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, we get, I've gotten f just flurries of calls the last two years about, you know, you need to go out and find the Lewis and Clark campsites. You know, it, I mean, it took us 100 years to find this place, and they were there for nine months, you know. I don't know how you can find something where somebody was there for a few days. But yeah, they, they did camp all the way across the river and then all out into Colorado. Um, finding them, I, you know, it'd be difficult. I would like to find out, and I think we, we can find this out, what Pawnee Village they stayed at. Uh, that'd be kind of, because we did. It wouldn't be permanent because of the length of the trip. This was the only permanent. This was the only permanent, right. Yeah, I think. Other than a couple weeks stay with the Pawnee, everything else is probably just several day camps. Yeah, this was the only permanent place. And this is now the oldest uh, discovered and excavated Euro-American site in Nebraska. There's a couple older ones like Lisa's Post, which is supposed to be just down the road from here, but we can't find it. Um, and there's a couple of Spanish trading posts which are older, but they've never been found. So this is actually by several months the oldest that's ever been found in Nebraska of a Euro-American period site, Euro, you know, European-American site. No more questions? That means either it was boring or I said everything and... and <laughs> very good. Well, she said very good. The Department oh, of good. Roads, okay, that road project. Right. Now that the site has been discovered, have they made any changes in their plans with that road? Like maybe no, no, actually the road's under, the road's almost done. We've been, I've been monitoring the construction throughout this spring and fall. Um, other than nicking a few of these little fireplaces, they've just they've missed the whole thing by that much. I mean, it, so they really didn't do any any. There was no adverse impact to it. But they did. If once we found it, we, we had talked to them, and if it was going to go right through the middle of it, they would have redesigned the project to avoid it. Um, but uh, we've been watching it pretty closely. And nothing's nothing's turned up that's in there right away. Thank goodness. You know, I thought it was going to be. Uh, but we haven't had any problems at all. We've got the tent set up there, but it's not secure. Um, it's up there in the Ponca Hills area, and uh, a lot of the, the uh, some of our neighbors and adjacent landowners said, you know, we've we had a lot of problems. You know, they have problems with vandalism and, you know, just kids out there, and we haven't. I mean, I put up a little fence, you know, a kind of a, one of those orange construction fences, and people may be getting in there wandering around, but they're not doing any damage, and which I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised. Probably go out there tomorrow and it'll be all ruined. Shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> Anything else? Somebody? Yes, sir. How many people, you may have mentioned this early on, but how many people were stationed there? I don't know the exact number. Um, uh, Gail would know, but somewhere in the order of 15 or 20, we think. Again, because we know the names of, of all the officers and gentlemen, we don't. But there's sort of generic reference to some enlisted men and boatmen and that kind of stuff. But we think maybe 15 or 20. Um, and it may have also been used a little bit later. Uh, it's next to a limestone quarry, which actually was the which was a commercial quarry in the 1950s and 60s. But it was where they quarried their limestone, and also where when they built Fort Atkinson, which is five miles north of here, they were using they were bringing boats down and quarrying limestone from the same place. So they may have been staying in this cabin, which would have been ruins or maybe still standing at the time. But we think somewhere 15 or 20. But again, there may have been a little bit of people coming in later, you know, a couple years later. Peter, do you have a question? Did they, did they have any horses? Did they acquire horses? From this I don't know if they had horses. Anybody know the answer to that? Who's Gail is here? Who's Gail? I'm not sure. I'll find out. If not, I'll just make it up. Okay. We haven't found any horseshoes or anything. Or we have we have had some horse bone, but I think it's related to that farmstead. No. Yes, ma'am. How long were they? Did you say they were there? What time of year was it? They were there from September of 1819 to June of 1820. So, eight eight nine months. Yeah, they 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 set up there in the fall, built those cabins pretty quick. There's some I think in. One of the journal, I think, I don't remember the date in September, but by early in October, uh, the, the journal entries say we've built our spacious cabins and we're all comfy and tucked in for the winter. So they, they slapped those things together pretty quick. They were log cabins. They looked white in that painting, but we think it might have been whitewashed or maybe had some, uh, had some adobe or something on it. But they say they cut, they cut logs. Why they look like they're white, flat-faced things, I'm not sure, but they were pretty specific. They were log buildings with stone fireplaces. Why did they stop at that specific place? I'm not really sure. I think they just needed to play, they, you know, they didn't want to continue on over the winter. Now Long went back, I believe, over the winter. He didn't stay. He stayed for a while and then he went back to the East Coast 
And so they sort of had to wait for him to get back. Um, and they, like I said, they were originally going to go all the way up the Missouri River. And for a reason which is known, but I don't know right now, um, they got new orders to head west. Uh, so it might have been that they were waiting for Lon to get back. And he might have brought the orders. Yes, I think so. Right, right. So they had to kind of hang out there longer than they really needed to. Yeah, because they were there until June. So even though it's called a winter camp, it's really sort of a fall, winter, spring camp. And being down there in the summer, I can tell you right now, it's not a place for a summer camp. It's about the most hideous place you could, mosquitoes, ticks, humidity. Yeah. Beautiful in the fall. Yes, sir. Yes, if you wanted to look at the reports of the people in the uh, expedition mm -hmm. had written up, where mm -hmm. would you look? The best thing is that one of the expedition members was named Edwin James. And he took not only his own notes and observation, but some of the other one and, and wrote a book on it called an account of an expedition from Pittsburgh to the Rocky Mountains, which was written, you know, in 1820s or 30s. It's been reprinted many times. I think it's University of Oklahoma Press. Tom or Doug, do you know who? I think the University. Or I'm not sure, but it's it's Edwin James. Originally, I think eight, in the 1820s, but but there's been. I mean, I, we have an edition that's from the 1970s or 80s. That's the best place to start. Yes. Is that as far as they went with boats? Yes, up. it is. It is. That's as far as they went with the boats. What the, a lot of people ask me what happened to the, to the Western engineer and some of these boats. I don't know. I, apparently, somebody did some research. The Western engineer did make its way back to the East Coast somewhere. Where it now lies, who knows? It, you know. uh, but yeah, that, I think that they stopped with the boats there. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, a, a um, looked at some aerial photographs over the years and we're I think we can see now um, even that land, that floodplain now, which used to be cultivated, where the harbor is, has all been bought by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's now Boyer Shoot National Wildlife Refuge. And they've, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has restored the habitat back to native grass. And they even through probably some geologic coring have found that there is a channel out there and they've kind of not dredged it out but made it a little bit lower so it'll have a different kind of like cattail vegetation more consistent with what it was. And boy, that channel matches very closely with the painting. Um, so I think we know just about exactly where it was. So maybe we can go, go out there and dig next year and find some of these boats. <laughs> Great. Yes? This doesn't go back that far, but uh, I'm very glad that Major Long did his trip up there. Because mm -hmm. I've been on top of his peak twice. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and Long, yeah. I may be wrong, but my understanding was Long didn't go up there. He sent James up there. Here, you go up there, and then when you get back down, I'll take the name of the thing. Um, Long uh, went on. I mean, this was—he was pretty young, as you can tell. But but he went on to have a very very illustrious career, and you know, I think he went to a variety of places around the world, um, doing engineering and exploring and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's fun project. And uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have a. Um, History Conference in Omaha, October 9th and 10th, something like that. It's going to focus on this. We're going to have some of these paintings there. We're going to have a, a display of some of the artifacts, pictures of the excavations. Uh, I'm going to give probably the same talk, but I'll try to make, make it a little different. Um, have some other speakers there. Uh, Hugh Genoways from the university is going to speak about the, the mammalogy there and some of the scientific work there. Uh, Roger Nichols, um, who wrote a book on, um, on uh, Long is going to also speak. I think he's at Arizona now, University of Arizona or Arizona State, I'm not sure, but he's going to come up and speak. So, And uh, if you're not members of the Historical Society, the best way to get a free ticket is to be a member of the Historical Society to go to this conference. So I was told to say that, but I mean it sincerely. <laughs> I do. Um, and we're also, as I think I mentioned, probably in September or October going to do another week of excavation there using volunteers. We try to do that once a year if we have a project open it up to not archaeologists, but to just general members of the public who have some interest in coming out and doing this. And we've got a list of several hundred people that are interested in working any project we have. And what we'll do is we'll just contact everyone on that list and say, we're going to work this week. If you want to come out, come on out. So if anybody um, wants to get on that list, uh, contact us. Uh, contact Michelle Furby, our secretary at, in the archaeology division. She'll put you on the list. Um, it's a lot of fun. You know, again, we did it last year in October. Nice weather. We supply all the tools. Deb? I um, might want to mention also in conjunction with the October event that we, we will be taking people on a tour to the site. Right, we're going to have yeah, part of that. Yeah, part of that event, the October conference, we're going to have a tour up there, a bus tour up there, and also to Fort Atkinson and Boyer Shoot, right? 
Yeah. 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 Yes. One other advantage is if you help is uh, you might end up with a T-shirt that says "I dig Nebraska." You got one of that, right? <laughs> want another one? We got a lot of. <laughs> what do you mean by Oh well, I, uh, Dr. Genoway is at the University is in Mammalia. He studies mammalian behavior and and mammalian you know taxonomy of you know. I think he has particularly interest in certain kinds of shrews or bats, I don't know, but, but he, you know, he remarked to me that this was, you know, you go, oh, okay, you guys found engineer cantoma, that's something that's kind of been in the, you know, the, the zoological and mammalogical lore for a long time because it's where so many Great Plains species were first identified and typed, given a Latin name, described, you know, first, first known to science, you know, like the garter snake and some of this stuff uh, was at this place, yeah, and he's a mammalogist, so he's going to, give a talk on kind of the, the history of science perspective on this. As I mentioned, it's really more than just archaeology. So, yes? Does that area flood occasionally? Well, um, the, the floodplain certainly floods, and, and, but the Gibriels who own the land, um, they live there for 30 or 40 years, and actually it's kind of deceptive. It looks like we're right on the floodplain. It was actually on a little terrace, about a meter, a meter and a half above the floodplain. Yeah, they've gotten, they said they never got it completely flooded when they were there. Um, and the geomorphologist, uh, Jeremy at the University of Nebraska, Kearney, who's working on this, will be able to tell us a lot more about that. But he thinks that, that it didn't, I mean, there's e episodes of big thunderstorms or, or when it was real dry, when the, there was more of that soil looks like it's slope wash coming down from the bluffs as opposed to flood water. So it is perched up on a little bench. And, and you know, luckily, it, it, um, if, it, if they had built this out on the floodplain, it would be gone. Because one thing he's noticed by looking at air photos and old maps is that that channel has just been all over the place. And it's probably scoured out. There's a companion site to this called Cantonment, Missouri, which was, where, which was much bigger. And that's where all the military guys went that ultimately built Fort Atkinson. They went up there a few months after these guys, about five miles north. They built Cantonment, Missouri right on the floodplain and got, had all kinds of disasters with flooding, um, big scurvy epidemic. You know, it, it didn't go well at all. And, and they ended up building... Fort Atkinson on top of the bluff because of, you know, and that site we've never found, I don't think we could find it. I think if it really was on the floodplain, the river has moved around so much, it just, it just scours out stuff. There may be artifacts there, but from there, but they're probably down in New Orleans now, you know, just, I mean, literally, it, it, you know, so, so having these guys, it's because they were engineers probably, um, <laughs> putting their thing on this little elevated area. Is, is, was good for them, so I don't think they, I mean, they talk about it, you know, having some water, but not being flooded out. And so it was an advantage to them, it's been an advantage to us, because I think that's why it's preserved so well, you know, didn't get washed away. Yes? Do you, do you have a phone number from Michelle Furby? Yes, 471-4760. On TV there, <laughs> just <keep> it. <laughs> it's just, it's just cable access. It's not like it's <laughs> CNN, <laughs> History Channel. Her that's her. Yeah, that's her <laughs> office number, not her home. <laughs> it's going to be a long afternoon, I think, isn't it, Michelle? Any other questions? I'm hungry. Okay. Thank you.